Welcome to the Whole Athlete Podcast, where we focus on discussing topics to help you become a fat burner, optimize health, and improve performance in life and sports. Transform the whole you from the inside out with the holistic method. Let's dive in. Here's your host, Debbie Potts. Hi, everybody. It's Debbie Potts, and I'm the host of the Whole Athlete Podcast, but we're always looking at different topics to help you find new ways to improve your performance in your sport and also daily life. And today we have someone that's local, works near me in Bellevue, Washington, Dr. Fisk. And he's not on video, so if you're watching a video, you'll, we'll put his website up. But thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate your uh, invitation. Yeah, it's always great to find people locally that are offering different treatments to help improve athletes' performance. So talk a little bit about who you are, and I ask people often, what is your passion, purpose, and why? How are you creating impact? Sure. So my name is Zach Fisk. I'm a medical doctor, an MD, and uh, my uh, original training is in anesthesiology. After that, I did a fellowship in acute pain management um, and nerve blocks. And after I did that fellowship, I began a uh, perioperative pain practice uh, at the local VA here where I helped veterans uh, deal with their pain around the time of surgery. And in so doing, I noticed there was a big hole in perioperative pain management after surgery, meaning people go home. And all of a sudden, they have a lot of pain after they leave the hospital or leave the ER. And the only thing that they can do is turn to their PCP or their surgeon or um, some other provider that they might uh, be acquainted with and get more opiates. And I think that that has um, uh, certainly contributed to the opiate epidemic. So the original uh, intent of my clinic um, was to sort of tackle the opiate stand, uh, the, the opiate problem in this country from a preventative standpoint. And so I opened the clinic that, where we can provide nerve blocks, nerve catheters after people get home uh, from surgery. And um, I was also seeking out, you know, in, in the subacute period or meaning not just right after surgery, but in the subsequent two or three months after surgery, what can we do to help patients sort of recover without needing to turn once again to medications, not only opiates, but also other medications that might lead to um, sedation or brain fog, and inability to kind of recover or rehabilitate as they want to. And so I, um, that's where I became familiar with treatments such as nerve cryotherapy, PRP, uh, stem cell, and um, I found that as an alternative to surgery, those treatments can be uh, very helpful as well. Um, sometimes before surgery, a patient will come and ask me if there's an alternative. And I tell them usually that they should follow their surgeon's advice, but that we can oftentimes bridge them to the surgery, uh, or if they wanted to try my therapy as an alternative to surgery, for example, PRP, uh, it's a it's a nice first step that's extremely low risk. So that's sort of the the, the overall the overarching theme of the office is this perioperative pain management. So what we want to talk a little bit more about today is choose how you use regenerative protocols to help athletes recare, sure. repair and recover. Talk about that. Right. Sure. So um, certain injuries uh, are very amenable to injection therapy. Traditionally, injection therapy has consisted of steroid injections, but it has been found lately in the last few years, studies have demonstrated that steroids can be very bad for tendons, especially, and probably ligaments as well. And so um, PRP and the regenerative, which is sort of the base that's actually not the base. The base is prolotherapy. Prolotherapy is just dry needling or injection of a, a high concentration sucrose formulation uh, into and around uh, a damaged structure, which is supposed to induce an inflammatory healing response. And the next step up from there, I would say, is PRP. PRP is where you extract somebody's own blood and you spin it to isolate 
platelets, which is what the, the name is derived from, platelet-rich plasma. Platelets are the are classically known for their ability to provide a, immediate hemostasis after an injury, meaning if you cut your arm, um, platelet will flood the area and cause a clot. But there's other things that platelets do. They actually have a lot of uh, granules within them that contain growth factors, and those growth factors stimulate healing response and actually stimulate the, the uh, body's own uh, stem cells to start manufacturing the products necessary to heal the, the surrounding tissue that's been damaged. And so PRP involves extracting somebody's own blood, spinning it down, isolating the platelets, and injecting those platelets back and into and around the areas of injury. And those areas of injury can be tendons and ligaments. That's the most common. You can also use it to speed up the healing of a wound. And I would so, say PRP is a fantastic... Go ahead. Well, no, go ahead. I was just going to ask who's a, the best for, for what type of injuries. And, you know, athletes sure. always get, you know, plantar fasciitis and knee pain and problems. So what type Correct. of injuries do you yeah. work so, with? For very definitive injuries, so for example, plantar fasciitis, we know it's the plantar fascia. You can see it under ultrasound or under MRI that the plantar fascia is swollen, irritated. Uh, injecting PRP around the plantar fascia can speed the healing process. This used to be done with um, steroid, but the problem is that steroid comes with its own complications. It can weaken the tendon. It can cause something called fat pad atrophy, which can actually worsen the condition. Uh, because you no longer have a supportive fat pad preventing or, or absorbing some shock. So for plantar fasciitis, it's, it's very useful. Uh, tennis elbow is another very common uh, indication for PRP. Um, ten, and once again, the, the tendon, the extensor tendon, is what is injured in, um, yeah. in that condition. And uh, it can cause a lot of problems, not only for tennis players, but also um, any athlete where there's a lot of wrist movement involved in the sport. Uh, and by injecting PRP, we've not found in in vitro studies, which means in the lab, that PRP damages tendons. Whereas we found have found that steroids damage tendons. So PRP is a very you're just injecting uh, your own blood back into that area. So it's a very safe procedure, and it often can be very helpful. Uh, studies have demonstrated that it is at least effective as steroids in the early stages, and by you know 26, 30 weeks out. Steroid efficacy has waned substantially, which PRP continues to demonstrate uh, improvements in pain for a large majority of patients who have tennis elbow. So and it's legal. Yeah, it's ahead. not like, you know, if we did the Tour de France that's on right now, <laughs> if we oh, right. did uh, injections, you just think PRP injections sounds like, you know, people are doing that's not legal. But this is if you had a drug test to do a race, this would be legal to do. There, yeah, there, it's no drug. There's no drug involved. Yeah, it's your own blood. Um, you just, it's your own blood. Uh, um, I mean, except for a tiny little poke mark, you can't even tell that it was done, really. Uh, but more than that, it, it is legal. Um, and I don't think there's any reason to, to, con to be concerned that an athlete is giving themselves an advantage by healing an injury more quickly. You're not um, improving your you know, muscle tone or imp improving your blood's oxygen carrying capacity, which is, I think, what, what most people are concerned about when it comes to blood doping. You're just letting an injury heal itself more quickly. And that's an important point. PRP and all of these regenerative therapies, they're not miracle cures. They tilt the balance uh, of the body. There's a constant balance in the body between irritation of an area and degradation. So your tendon is rubbing against bone or or is constantly being irritated by whatever repetitive motion you're doing, and a healing process trying to recover from those micro injuries that occur throughout the day, throughout an athlete's day, where the PRP simply injects growth factors that tilt the bow, the scale towards the healing rather than degradation. Got it. So you also do, it says on here, stem cell therapy. So how is that different? The stem cell, you're doing something different, obviously, and then when do people need to choose that yeah. option versus PRP. Yeah, I will say up front that stem cells um, are extremely controversial because uh, certain clinics will advertise their ability to cure every single ailment under the sun that seemed to be previously untreatable, like heart conditions or lung conditions. And um, there's been a lot of problems regulating that industry. 
one of the, the issues is there's several types of stem cells, some of which are allowed, other which are less allowed. Um, FDA can crack down on certain stem cell clinics, for example. Um, stem cells ha are sort of a more potent form of PRP in a way. And you are actually inject, you're isolating stem cells rather than just growth factors. So live cells, and then you're injecting those live cells theoretically back into the area of injury. And because it's a more potent form, you can treat more conditions than you can with just PRP. At least that's, mm -hmm. that's what's um, postulated. So for example, PRP is growth factors. And so growth factors I, can recruit stem cells, the body's own stem cells in a very specific targeted area around a tendon, whereas P, uh, stem cells are often used to inject into ar arthritic joints in hopes of recovering those arthritic joints. Now, end-stage arthritis is not going to be helped by stem cells at all. Earlier-stage arthritis, the stem cells have shown some promise, at least early studies. And I think people need to understand that these are early studies. So there's a lot of questions that are unanswered about stem cells. What's the best type of stem cell to use? There's three major types. There um, bone marrow-derived stem cells. There's fat-derived stem cells, and finally, there's what we call allogeneic stem cells, which are stem cells derived uh, from somebody else, from the umbilical cord of life, healthy birth babies, for example. That's, there's no ethical issues with that because the baby's already born, then you're extracting the stem cells from the umbilical cord. But there is regulatory issues with that. You're not technically not allowed to provide those stem cells, according to the FDA, um, unless they are approved as a drug at this point. Um, so that sort of limits people to fat versus bone marrow, and then fat also the FDA considers a no-no because you're, they, consider the, they consider fat to be a primarily a cushioning apparatus within somebody's body. And if you're using it for non-cushioning purposes, for example, for stem cell treatments, the FDA considers that um, uh, bad unless you get it approved as a drug. So basically, legal, from a regulatory standpoint, you're limited. Clinics that want to follow the regulatory guidelines limited to bone marrow. And bone marrow has been demonstrated in some early studies to be very helpful in early stage arthritis or indeed if you want a more potent injection around some uh, problematic tendons. Uh, another interesting thing to note about stem cells is they actually uh, do sim something similar to what PRP does just in a more potent way. And, and, and what, I, what I mean by that is you think you inject a bunch of stem cells and they turn into the tissue you want them to become. That's what everybody thinks might happen. But in fact, that's not what happens. Uh, they found in most studies that only about 5% of the regenerated tissue that they, they sample, you know, six months later are from those stem cells. In fact, what the stem cells do is they recruit, and again, they recruit the body's own stem cells in that area to regenerate the necessary tissue. So that's an interesting hmm. point that stem cells actually are not turning into, for the most part, the tissue need. They're actually just a more potent recruiter of one's own natural stem cells. And that actually is an important point uh, when thinking about one's age and when you get a regenerative treatment. The older you are, the less stem cells you have generally. And unfortunately, that means that the ability to extract your own stem cells from your bone marrow and also the ability for those stem cells to recruit the local stem cells within a, a damaged area is less. So we have found a degradation of efficacy as one ages. And that's when the more the, uh, the stem cells derived from somebody else, like the live healthy birth uh, tissue, uh, you know you're going to get a sort of constant supply of stem cells there and then injecting them back into the into the older person might be a better route to take in that case. And I, I, I want to back this all up by saying that because of the regulatory concerns, I, I provide a lot of guidance and advice and I work with providers who have done stem cell therapy for many, many years. Um, but I'm, I'm, very, I'm very conservative when it comes to providing stem cells. It's, I usually tell people to start with PRP, a few rounds of PRP. And if that doesn't, if, that's, if that seems to be wearing off, then maybe we need to upgrade to something more potent like stem cells. But if, if it's not working, PRP is not working, in my opinion, oftentimes, because it's just a milder form of stem cells, I, don't, I often tell people, I don't know if you're going to benefit from stem cells if the PRP isn't working. How many times do people need to do PRP before they realize it's not helping? Because I've heard of clients that have been personal trainer for 25 years, so I've had a lot of people over the years have injuries that don't go away and that they've tried PRP, but it doesn't work for everybody, as you're saying. You know, sometimes it just right. doesn't help them. Right. Yeah. And I mean, 
there's some protocols that offer a few injections at, at a time. What I, I you know, um, one needs to balance the profit-driven, you know, market for this, um, you know, ethical, ethical considerations. So what I do is I usually tell people if the PRP has no effect whatsoever, you're probably not going to benefit from a repeat attempt unless there was a technical issue in extracting and spinning the PRP or a technical issue in not being able to visualize adequately the target that we wanted to inject. And that's that's possible. Mm -hmm. So it might be worth repeating just to make one more go just to see if perhaps we can improve a part of the technique. But if PRP was injected perfectly, if it was uh, created perfectly and still yet no effect, in my opinion, probably what is not the solution for you. And maybe regenerative medicine isn't the solution. And usually if people want to try stem cells at that point, I'll refer them um, to some people in the community that I trust to to explore those options. We've been doing that stem cells for 20 years. Yeah. Um, and uh, in terms of, you know, PRPs, a, a series of injections. I do, some people continue to demonstrate an improvement after two or three um, injections, maybe it's spaced uh, a month apart. Um, but, and, and oftentimes what I'll see, if a PRP works really well, the effect will degrade over the next few, maybe at six months, the effect will start to wane, in which case they might want a, a repeat injection. If it continues to wane every six months, that might be an indication that stem cells are something to consider. Um, but PRP, uh, it does, it's not for everybody. It doesn't work for everybody. And unfortunately, we just don't know. We don't have enough data to, to, to say it's definitely going to work for you. It's definitely not going to work for you. Some reasons why it might not work is if somebody's on anti, a lot of anti-inflammatories. So what PRP does is it modulates inflammation. It doesn't eliminate it. Um, and, mo and inflammation isn't necessarily a bad thing yeah. all the time. It, it does have healing products within it. You know, it causes pain, which is why people like to eliminate it with steroid or anti-inflammatories. But it has a healing effect. So what PRP does is it modulates inflammation and directs the inflammation towards the healing response. So there might, there's oftentimes reason to, to continue to uh, response with PRP, and if you if you if you inject steroid or if you're taking um, immunomodulatory therapy for rheumatoid arthritis, for example, which inhibits inflammation, then it may not be as effective. Um, and yeah, go ahead. I just was Next also going to ask in there, what is your philosophy on the pain medications people take? You know, get the steroid shots, or people take Advil, Aleve, any you know pills forever to just the anti-inflammatory. So. It seems like a lot of people take way too much, like it's, you know, vitamin pills. So what's your take on that for when you're treating clients, patients? Sure. You know, for anything in, in, in moderation is, is safe. And, it, it, you know, many things in moderation are safe. For example, the uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatories. If you get an acute injury, you hurt your, you bang your elbow, you, you hurt your tendon, whatever, uh, you tear your meniscus. Um, for two or three weeks, taking that to overcome that injury is is a perfectly safe thing to do. And in fact, taking it, taking anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen consistently can reduce the swelling consistently in that area. And if it's a minor injury, your body will still be able to recover despite the lack of inflammatory response. But taking anti-inflammatory medications, uh, especially the COX, the non-selective COX inhibitors, by that I mean ibuprofen. Uh, Advil, Aleve, uh, Naprox, things like that, those can cause long-term damage, like damage to your gut, damage to your kidneys, high blood pressure, and corresponding damage to your heart. And so taking those medications forever is, is, can be detrimental. There are medications that have come out on the market that uh, limit certain parts of those side effects, especially the GI component. Those are called COX-2 inhibitors. And the most famous of which was Vioxx, which was taken off the market because COX-2 inhibitors still cause other side effects like high blood pressure and in association with that, heart problems. And so Vioxx was found in post aftermarket studies to have caused a lot of heart problems. So it was taken off the market for that reason. There are other COX-2 inhibitors that have not demonstrated as many heart problems as Vioxx. And one very common example of that is uh, Celebrex or Celecoxib. And so for patients with chronic arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis, they will take Celecoxib or Celebrex long term. And as long as they have their kidney function monitored and their blood pressure controlled, 
um, they oftentimes will be able to take that medication without the fear of developing a GI bleed, which can happen with uh, ibuprofen. Um, another know, common medication. Yeah, go ahead. I just know a lot of people in athletes over the years doing Ironman's marathons, a lot of people just take that all the time. And they just, right. it always concerns me that people take it too much dependent on instead of trying like a turmeric or a, a natural anti-inflammatory and flame less type of supplement to get rid of the inflammation, excess inflammation sure. in your body than just pounding Advil leave yeah. anti-inflammatories. Yeah, and you don't want to mask, um, you know, an injury that might improve with a little bit of rest, proper physical therapy, PRP. You don't want to mask those injuries for too long with anti-inflammatories because they do just tend to get worse over time and eventually cause problems. And of course, for a professional athlete, that's of course, that's not an easy thing to admit that you need to take some time, and let this injury heal, and do proper physical therapy on it, and take take a break, but. Uh, that's definitely something that at a certain point, the athlete will realize, you know, this is just not getting better. I'm having to use more and more ibuprofen. Maybe I need to think uh, about an alternative way of dealing with this issue, even if it affects my uh, athletic uh, career in some way for a little while. Mm -hmm. Well, I think a lot of athletes are, you know, competitive athletes like I was and I will be someday again being type A personality that we just like, you know, try to make it, you're almost at a race. And I've had, you know, my first time I qualified, second time I qualified for Ironman Hawaii, I had a bike crash. No, it's first time the week, the month before. And I did everything I could. It was my first Ironman Hawaii and I wasn't going to skip that. <laughs> so broken elbow, yeah. ulna, you know, I was doing whatever I could. So I think, yeah, I, I always tell my clients now it's like, all right, you could take six weeks and, you know, do some different type of training to keep staying in shape and train, right. or you can take six months off if you just don't pay attention to those red right. flags. And my, my athlete, my, uh, what I do, I, I do a lot of uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and yes. uh, it's, I love it. It's my, you know, one of my favorite pastimes and I've done it for a lot of years now. And it's when I have to take a break from it for an injury, uh, it's really detrimental to me mentally Yes. And because I have such an addiction to it. So, uh, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I don't compete or anything and it's still really difficult, but eventually, you know, and for example, if I hurt my wrist then I will tuck my arm into my, my belt and uh, I'll train with one arm for a while. And it does it, you know, when you can do these alternate, these things that just help your, make you stronger, your, your limb recover, it actually improves other yeah. aspects of your, of your game. Yes. So it's, it's, it's not necessary. You can, there's always a silver lining to these things. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I, was, I always think everything happens for a reason. You have to figure out what's the learning lesson from this experience you have to yeah. go through, even though you hate it at the time, but it always works right. out in the end. I so think what? tenacity is very important. Exactly. You need to um, realize that as long as you're tenacious and you don't give up and you seek out alternative techniques or, tech, or alternative um, lifestyle so for at least a little while, you'll find that you're just as happy and, and you're getting better. So yeah, I agree people, with that. People don't realize the recovery part. And I know into the fitness industry, where it's, it's train hard, recover harder, is finally becoming a little bit more of a trend because people don't ever take days off. They just train hard every day. So not kind of train right. that black hole that they're actually causing more harm than good. So that's going to the next question is talking about other – modalities as cryotherapy and I know we do infrared therapy and I'm finding that's really beneficial for pain relief but you do a different type of cryotherapy that a lot of places are doing those chambers I tried it once at Northwest mm -hmm. cryotherapy I thought I was freezing cold for 24 hours <laughs> afterwards but you're doing a nerve oh, really? that's interesting a nerve well, I'm a yeah, so I like 90 100 degree weather so I'm cold <laughs> uh cryotherapy is interesting new kind of a new trend all over the country i find that little cryotherapy clinics pop up around the areas the main cities but you're what are you doing with cryotherapy what's your philosophy and treatment yeah so mine is very very different um modality than than, than the cryo chambers or basically the heat and cold therapy used for post-athletic recovery which i do believe in but i, I what i do is for patients who have very specific um, nerve entrapment syndromes neuropathies um, cryo freezing their nerves basically at about negative 80 degrees Celsius with a pinpoint needle um, can 
can effectively shut that nerve off, something ca causing something called stage two Wallerian nerve degeneration for, it's a fancy term, but basically it shuts their nerve off for uh, two to three months. And it allows them to have much less pain. So if they have to recover after, if they're having a ton of pain after surgery, for example, after they say that there's an athlete who uh, actually treated an athlete, a professional athlete who injured her knee and um, she was having severe uh, uh, radiating nerve pain down the inner 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 um, calf and which which can happen after knee surgery because you can damage a nerve called the saphenous nerve that's going down that region and cause really bad shooting pain so I, I froze that nerve for this patient and that took away the, took away that really bad shooting pain down her in her calf and allowed her to, uh, to participate in her uh, post-operative um, uh, physical therapy regimen much more effectively hmm. and strengthen those ligaments and muscles and tendons and such. So very specific nerves that are misfiring can be treated uh, with nerve cryotherapy. And the other corollary to that is a lot of people for back pain will have radiofrequency ablation, which is a burning of the nerves which tends to last longer than the, the freezing of these nerves. But burning of the nerves can have side effects. It can cause neuritis, which can worsen the pain temporarily. Freezing tends to make your pain better almost instantly um, with minimal inflammation and minimal pain afterwards. So it's, it's, it, But it doesn't last quite as long, only two or three months. So it's a great bridging therapy. If somebody wants to do a physical therapy regimen and recover um, from a, an injury that and they're having a lot of nerve pain. This can be very effective treatment for that. But it's very specific. It's not just for, you know, post-athletic recovery. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So there's one yeah. more thing, and uh, the ketamine infusions, and then the three pillars yeah. of therapy. I want to finish up right. with. Sure. Absolutely. So so what ketamine. The, yeah. Talk about that. Sure. Ketamine is a medication that's been around for many years. Um, it's uh, it's traditionally been used for anesthesia in both in human medicine and veterinary medicine. In recent years, it's found it's found to be a very potent analgesic or pain reliever. Um, and what it does is it uh, it, ha it attacks excitatory receptors on nerves, which are receptors that cause the nerve to fire a lot, and it it tamps those down. It's called the NMDA receptor. And the th thinking is if you have a nerve pain condition like CRPS, complex regional pain syndrome, or some other broad neuropathic pain syndrome, and you apply ketamine for an extended period of time to these nerves, which are misfiring, firing when they shouldn't, uh, you're able to reset these nerves metabol metabolically and provide extended pain relief for oh. those nerves. So some patients who have get you know whole body pain wind up after surgery or who have that condition CRPS or who have other neuropathic pain conditions that are sort of hard to treat with other modalities some patients benefit a lot from ketamine infusions unfortunately you need to repeat those infusions every uh, few months because the nerves the, the these patients just have a susceptible a susceptibility to have these nerves wind up and start hurting them again um, but it can be very helpful for some patients where nothing else seems to be working to try ketamine to help with nerve pain. Mm -hmm. And that bridges a little bit also into my, into that concept, the three pillars of, of um, recovering from painful conditions. Uh, one is treating the pain itself. One is the physical aspect of rehabilitating the structures and whole body. Um, and then the third is mental fortitude needed to endure that very trying process in one's life, being it, you know, where you can't do what you were doing before and you're in a lot of pain. And ketamine is all, uh, becoming a um, much more popular medication for the treatment of depression. It tends to, um, for some patients, not everybody, we don't know who's going to benefit and who's not, there's just not enough data out there, but for some patients, Ketamine can improve people's energy levels, it can improve people's motivation via a suppression of patient's depression. And so it contributes not only to one pillar, which is immediate pain control in some cases, but also to this other pillar, which can be mental fortitude. It can improve people's depressive symptoms. Hmm. And so it, it's, it's from in my practice, especially after surgery, 
to help tamp down um, kind of nerve pain or um, to help patients who have neuropathy, uh, you know, try something that might help them feel a lot better for a, one to three months. It, it, it's turned out to be a, quite a useful feature. Um, that it, it, so hmm. that's, that's I, ketamine and those pillars in a nutshell for you. Well, I would think uh, do, being depressed, if you're a competitive athlete, like I haven't been able to do an Ironman or, you know, since 2012 and I've had different issues, adrenal issues that started this whole domino effect for the last five years. And I know personally, you, know, you get kind of down sometimes because you can't do everyone else's, you know, training and doing these races. And even if, you know, you just want to do a half Ironman or do a marathon, you just can't do it because your body won't let you, right. that you have to deal with that. And it's someone else just emailed me for, that listens to our, our podcast that they, you know, want to do a race as well, but have some health issues from training and life and chronic stress that, you know, you have to be happy just to be healthy and alive and be able to enjoy doing an event and not be competitive. If you're used to being like, I was, I was top three in my age group, top 10 overall, you know, a lot of races that to go do a race now that I'm really slow and just being happy to be able to do something is kind of a mind switch. And it is such a, a mental thing you need to deal with when you go from professional athlete and you retire and your career's over. You know, I think a lot of professional athletes probably have it worse than just someone like me, sure. but I would think depression and, and finding some way to deal with that in a natural way is, is beneficial. Well, there's a lot of depressed people in Seattle. I will say that when I have patients who patients who want to try this for depression, uh, they always need to have a psychiatric professional on board because I'm not a psychiatrist. I do know a lot about depression because I, you know, I treat patients with it, but I do require a psychiatrist on board just to make sure that there, there's, because there's, you know, there, there's more traditional ways to deal with depression. It's medications or uh, counseling, and that sometimes that's plenty. Mm -hmm. That's enough. And so, ketamine um, is one of those emerging therapies where patients who can't tolerate the, the medications, which is actually pretty common, or they don't want to go to the next level and try something like electroconvulsive therapy for depression, or they, the counseling doesn't seem to be helping. Ketamine is a great low-risk option. At least as far as we know, it's low-risk. Uh, that you know, long-term use of low-dose ketamine like this, there's not a lot of studies out there. But from what we can tell, it doesn't seem to be causing any detrimental effects thus far. Uh, but it, but it is a nice option for people. I just do, I do have to give that caveat that patients. I always insist that they seek out a normal psychiatric pathway. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not usually a first-line therapy, but it can be very, very nice for people. You know, I and I love that because I always am saying this often daily that people need to refer out and not try to do everything themselves. And you have a nice referring provider list on your website, acutepaintherapies.com and how to connect people with other people that are going to focus on nutrition or, you know, psychologists and physical therapy that I think so many doctors in traditional medicine try to do it all. And they, they need to refer out when they're not getting anywhere. So it's great right. that you are offering what you specialize in. And then when it's, you know, they'll benefit from something else to, team up with other providers in the area. So that's right. how I found you. I know I what I don't know. know. Connecting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Do what yeah. you do best. I, more importantly, I'm, yeah, go ahead. Well, just saying the same thing, yeah. just do what you do best and refer out, you know, work with a, exactly. a good team of. And even when it comes to PRP, for example, you know, sometimes it's a simple case of tennis elbow. Other times, could it be radial tunnel syndrome? Could it be radial capitular joint instability? Could it be uh, lateral collateral ligament. There's a lot of other considerations for these medical conditions. And if I feel that this is not a straightforward case, I have a lot of orthopedic surgeons that I work with in the community um, that I will say, look, can you take a look at this guy? He wants to try PRP. I just want to make sure it's safe and you don't think anything else is going on. It might be surgical. So I will do that frequently if, if it's not very, it's not completely straightforward. So I agree with you. Good. Well, Focus on what you're good at. Exactly. So people can find you at acutepaintherapies.com. And if you're watching the whole athlete podcast on YouTube channel, you'll be able to see the website. We kind of went through some screen sharing pages while he was talking. And then any other links we want to add in there for you? That should do it. I think uh, that's a great place for people to start. They can reach me um, 
easily if they look on the website they'll find the phone number or our email contact us link is pretty readily apparent on the website as you all might have seen mm -hmm. um, and so that's a great way to, to be able to get a hold of us um, I'm sorry it wasn't I didn't have video available but I actually I'm happy that you're able to show the basics of the website That'll be helpful. yeah and sometimes Maybe it works so better. Than my face yeah even <laughs> if you were there I'd probably just go through the website because it kind of helps visually right. if you're watching the video see what you're talking about so sure. thank you so much for your time today and I look forward to working with you because we're locally so I'm sure perfect I have some people to send to you as we have aches and pains with everyone as we focus on improving the aging process for athletes and my studio we're doing more shared personal training and the 50 and older crowd and everyone's trying to stay healthy and active and still compete and just working out and sports but also races and I think you know we get I don't like to blame aging, but it's just more wear and tear in the body. We keep having more little <laughs> niggles in, uh, and uh, things going on. <laughs> so thank you so much. Yeah, no, I really appreciate, um, your inviting me to, um, talk on your show and, and, uh, share my sort of philosophy about this. And it's a passion of mine. So, uh, thank you very much for having me. Great. Well, thank you. And I know we're always looking ways to improve the whole athlete from the inside out and working on different remedies for pain and recovery is a huge area for athletes, especially when they want to get back to their sport of, of choice. So I think, you know, looking for someone as you, if you're in the Bellevue, Seattle area, you can find us program services on the website, or, you know, if you're in another city, you can look it up. I'm sure you can find some someone comparable of the big cities might have something you sound like you're pretty unique services so it might be hard to find it is a unique approach that's for sure but uh but there's other people that do what i do just not in the combination that i do it i would say okay that's, that's sort of the unique way that i approach things and if you guys have any questions find us on facebook and instagram i tend to use more so it's and the whole athlete podcast on Facebook and my Instagram handle is the holistic athlete. So you can find daily posts on there and then also check out our YouTube channel for the video version of all of our podcasts on the whole athlete podcast channel. All right. Thanks guys. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the whole athlete podcast. If you have any questions, feedback, or topic suggestions, let us know on Facebook or at wholeathletepodcast.com. You can help us continue and grow by leaving a review on iTunes. Thanks again and see you next time.